Welcome everyone to the Crisis Mappers webinar. We're really happy that you're joining us today. And we'd like to welcome Ariel Nunes from the World Bank's uh, GFDRR, the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, who's going to be speaking about the Open Data for Resilience Initiative and lessons learned from that project. Um, before we get started, I wanted to extend special thanks to the entire World Bank GFDRR team for their partnership, for their sponsorship, and for helping co-organize the last ICCM conference uh, in Washington this past October. So thank you all very much for your help. And um, we look forward to Ariel telling us a bit more about what the GFDRR has been up to lately. I'd also like to thank Curtis Garten and Adil Kamisa from Oculus Geotime. They've been partnering with us for a few years now and hosting the webinar series for us. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to turn over the floor to Ariel now to get started. Thank you, Jen. And hello, everyone. I'll start by sharing my screen. Just for one second while I turn out the, um, the slides. Okay, I assume you guys are already receiving the the feed from the from the presentation. Jen, can you confirm? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. You can go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so again, hi everyone. My name is Ariel Nunez, and I work with the World Bank uh, Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery Labs. Um, the idea for this presentation is um, to give uh, an introduction to the Open Data for Resilience Initiative, a program that we have worked on for the past two years, um, and also to, to tell you about the what is it that we do and um, a little bit of details on, on how we, we have tried to, to achieve our mission and what we have learned in the process. Now, the um, Open Data for Resilience initiative has started as part of a wider uh, open data effort at the World Bank. Um, you may be familiar with data.worldbank.org, where you can find indicators um, about the different countries and, and, and a lot of uh, data that is produced by the World Bank, as well as maps.worldbank.org, which contains information about projects that the World Bank is, is working on. Um, the spectrum of the open data, the spectrum of open data that we're working on, is actually not about opening up data that is, that is created or, or, or that is owned by the World Bank, but rather um, evangelizing in the different countries about how open data practices can actually um, increase and, and, and improve the, the resilience to, to natural hazards and reduce. Uh, and reduce the risk of, of disasters. Um, GFDRR did a publication a few years ago that is called Natural Hazards on Natural Disasters. As you can read from the title, it's we, we cannot stop earthquakes from happening, but we definitely can build better buildings that do not collapse on top of people. Um, so the disaster part is, is, is the one that is inevitable and, and the one that we should work on. Part of the recommendations of, of on that study was actually that um, proper access to information was essential to, to disaster risk reduction. So we have tried in the Open Data for Resilience initiative to address that, that need to better uh, communicate the risks. Uh, so Open DRI itself, it's, um, it, it's both sharing recommendations and sharing a vision, but also uh, investing in, in open source tools that can help implement um, actual programs and, and, and to try to integrate ourselves into the wider um, World Bank Group uh, project network. Um, basically, um, I should give a little bit of background. The, Part of the World Bank mission 
uh, I mean, part of it, um, uh, of the reach that, that it can have, it, it does not go all the way uh, to response. We are actually forbidden from, from engaging in, in response activities because it's not on our mandate. GFDRR focuses more on the pre-disaster, both in the mitigation and prevention, and prevention, preparedness, and prediction and early warning, as well as the later impact assessment, recovery, and reconstruction. Um, but the OpenBRI initiative focuses um, itself on the pre-disaster side, which uh, it's an interesting side and an interesting perspective to share with the with the Crisis Mappers Network, where I know a lot of you work uh, on on the response side and on impact assessment. So, what's the challenge that we're that we're trying to uh, to overcome? First. Um, a lot of the outcomes of the studies that are um, either sponsored by the World Bank or, or risk assessments that are taken on uh, by the country's climate change adaptation studies, they produce some multimedia. It could be videos. It could be uh, really interesting reports, uh, usually in PDF format. But the raw data that was used for these is usually, you know, there's not a lot of attention on it, and, and that's exactly what can be used uh, for a future potential scenario as um, as a pre-disaster data. So basically, we, we see that raw data is usually underappreciated. Second, whenever that raw data exists or, or the actual information about the risk exist, exists, it, it is fragmented in the different, um, in different uh, sections of the government or in different institutions. Um, Sometimes it's not even about the cost that the information has, but rather uh, the process, writing uh, emails, follow-up email is uh, wondering internal confusion whenever they get a, a request for, for sharing data. Um, also, the information is rarely made public. Information about actual, uh, let's say, flood-prone areas in, in some countries is considered to be really sensitive information because you know that it's also used for, um, for, for insurance. Um, so we're trying um, to address those concerns and also to build capacity in the disaster management agencies and, and, and governments in general um, to safe keep and, and, and use risk information for, for better uh, decision making. So what we're doing first we're helping ensure that data created by bank-funded projects is communicated to the public um, in a sense that satisfies um, the raw data and open access uh, as described before. Um, as you may know, the risk assessment uh, process, it has different inputs. The first one is the hazard, uh, and then with the hazard, the exposure um, um, I mean, hazard is earthquakes, floods, exposure could be houses, um, people, roads, different kind of infrastructure. Um, then the vulnerability is just um, how each of the of the different exposures can actually be affected by by the different uh, risks. That gives you uh, the outcome, which is which is a risk map that could tell you pro or losses or uh, the probability of. of um, of a given of an event of a given magnitude returning, usually um, there's a lot of focus on the risk aspect in showing risk maps, and not a lot of effort in sharing the, um, the hazards and exposure. We're basically working on the full spectrum, trying to make data for each of the categories um, available. So GFDRR itself funds a lot of risk assessments in different countries, and we try to make sure that there are platforms set up with their uh, where you can access that data and the data can be shared with the civil society and the government. Uh, one of these examples is HaitiData.org, which after the Haiti earthquake, uh, we use Geonode, which is an open source tool that we have been um, investing on, to upload all the data that was produced. There's a lot of LiDAR data uh, there. There's a lot of information about the different uh, potential risks, and this was created after the, the Haiti earthquake. Now, um, a really interesting story is when Hurricane Isaac 
uh, came last year and people were starting to, to scramble and look for information, we got uh, a really big spike on the site for people looking uh, at the LIDAR information and flood prone areas. So, so at least we know that at the, in the time of need, a lot of the effort that went into creating these data sets for a previous crisis um, could and was reused. To, to inform decisions of people on the ground. We received, uh, we were working there in partnership with the uh, humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uh, and the whole OpenStreetMap community in, in, in Haiti. Um, another example is the release of the exposure database. So this contains a lot of information about buildings, really detailed surveys. Um, in the Pacific and, uh, and that's available in a portal that is paris.sofac.org, um, which contains a lot of good exposure information. That doesn't contain the whole risk spectrum, but, but just for the exposure part, that can be used uh, for, for a lot of things. Now, the second action that we're doing is helping countries uh, better manage and share the risk information. So basically, um, this touches on the, um, on, on the aspect of, of, of national spatial data infrastructure, not seen as a big uh, monolithic uh, point where you can find the information, but rather uh, in the sense of setting up the networks, um, both networks of people and networks of, uh, of, of computers to be able to access the right data at the right time. So, so again, there. Um, we, we work directly with the disaster management agencies on setting up portals that contain the information that is most relevant to them, and we also invest in, in open source tools um, like Geonode, which is based on, on GeoServer, uh, Postgres, and, and, and a few other uh, widely known open source um, platforms. We invest in that so that other agencies, like say the Department of Health, uh, the different um, like geographical institutes can, can set up their own platforms and they can uh, really talk to each other in an interoperable way, uh, the way that it's being done in Europe uh, with the Inspire directive. So here, here's an example of a GNO deployment um, in Malawi. Uh, and here's a diagram for, for something really interesting that's happening in Bolivia where they are working on, on setting up the national SDI, but at the same time also working on, on setting up a platform to, to better uh, be prepared for the different uh, natural hazards and the event. And this is being led by the Civil Defense Agency uh, there in Bolivia. So it's a highly distributed um, way for them to, to, to share and, 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 and collaborate for disaster risk reduction. Now, the third um, action that we're doing is partnering with international organizations. Um, this is um, an example of something that we did with um, RCMRD, which is a, um, a multinational technical agency in, in the Horn of Africa. We also work with the World Food Program uh, on this website. Um, basically on the on the data side and data gathering side and we work with development teams um, to just try to find people who are working actively uh, during the the horn drought uh, that was 2011 yeah two years ago um, and, and share all the information that that we could. Um, another example is the open, uh, the risk atlas that is happening in the Caribbean, taking risk information from all the different countries in the in the Caribbean. Um, so at last, um, and it's also I think one of the most important ones, we're trying to design tools that can be reused, um, not only for disaster risk management but also. Um, in other fields, so we're investing in heavily, uh, heavily in open source, including quantum GIS, GeoServer, building decision support tools. As you can see in the screenshot, this is um, a tool called InaSafe 
that is being used um, as an, uh, uh, to create scenarios uh, and and try out and see well if there was a flood here like it was in 2007 how many uh, buildings or may have to be closed now this is an example in in Indonesia which is where the tool was developed in collaboration with the Australian uh, Indonesian facility for disaster re risk reduction and using a lot of data collected um, by the humanitarian open stream map project uh, there in Indonesia uh, all of these is actually being used right now on the ground uh, because Jakarta, as you, as you may know, is flooded right now, really, really uh, big floods. And so um, we're happy to see that the tool um, has helped at least focus on the right questions um, beforehand and, and, and work on, on get all that um, exposure information that can be that can be then used to assess the damage. Another example is a collaboration with the climate change uh, group at the World Bank. It's, it was to say, okay, this data was gathered to better understand uh, climate change and climate adaptation in Mozambique. Uh, why don't we put all these data available um, to the community and to the other agencies and, and brainstorm and find ways to use these for disaster risk reduction too. Uh, in many countries, the, um, the agenda for, for climate change and the agenda for, for disaster risk reduction are sort of separate and, and not always interconnected. We are trying really, really hard to at least connect with the, um, with the group working on that at the World Bank, and, and we welcome, um, you know, other people who, who are working on, on, on similar uh, fields to, to talk to us and see if we are and collaborate in different countries where we're working on. Now, so that was the general overview about what we're doing. And now I'm going to share uh, the approach, um, the actual details, and how we have uh, been doing some of these things. Uh, what I expect is to share with you, especially the potential pitfalls uh, for, for, for each of these um, approaches, uh, just so that you have it in mind when you're when you're planning um, similar initiatives or when, it, when it's more targeted but it's still trying to build capacity or open up data uh, on different countries. Um, you know, take everything I'm going to say from now on, not a, you know, with a grain of salt. Um, it's just a little bit of our experience uh, and just add all the preambles there so, so you know that it's um, just an opinion. So the way we have approached project preparation and supervision, um, we, we have tried many ways, uh, including going ourselves and basically saying um, it's important for us to understand how these projects uh, are actually developed. So instead of hiring someone, let's go ourselves for two or three months um, and, and really talk to the disaster management agency about the, the, the challenges that they're having, the, the projects that they're working on, the kind of data that they have available, the data gaps. Uh, we have tried hiring local staff, um, international consultants, uh, and also working remotely. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to share a little bit of a of, um, story on each one, <laughs> usually a, um, a sad one on how, uh, how things have gone well sometimes and, and, and not so well on others. Um, when we have done the extended missions, that actually has worked uh, really well. The only problem is that we have um, lost a lot of uh, opportunities here in in the headquarters to really connect and, and, and amplify our work um, and influence other people's projects. So while it was perfect at the beginning when we were starting, say the first six months or first six years, where we were understanding what, what the needs were, um, it's not something that we do uh, that we do anymore because as, uh, as we understand the problem better, we're able to um, to scale instead of doing uh, everything ourselves. So that's a really we think that's a really good way to start. Now the second one about hiring local staff. Um, this is usually done to through bigger World Bank projects. Um, and in our case, we have the experience with both having people that are managed uh, from the headquarters in the U.S. 
and people that, that, that are managed directly by the disaster management agency on the ground specific to the project. Um, the, this is obvious in, in retrospect, but, but the, the part when there's a consultant there and, and, and not really supervision on the ground hasn't worked so well, um, even after the, the best efforts to, to engage uh, to engage, you know, weekly or, or even more frequent than that. Um, but when the when the person leading the project is from the disaster management agency, uh, and you just give them more resources to, to to attack the problem, that has worked really, really well. Now, about the international consultants, we obviously before sending the person, we know that has it both the technical and and people skills. Um, to work on the different project, but what has happened so far um, is that most of the times it's, it's really hard to, to do any of the knowledge transfer if, if a process hasn't been um, started in advance. Um, when we try to do a lot of capacity building, this, this implies that we need someone who's able on, on, on the receiving end to be able to receive the different concepts, learn the different tools, um, and, and that's one of the hardest parts. And we haven't seen that that that, that having someone uh, come outside, do the work, and then having to to leave ha has worked that well. Um, well, there's good work that 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 is done, but it's really hard then to uh, to ensure that that it continues. Um, the other option of of doing remote kickoff meetings and, and remote technical support has actually worked really well. And, it, um, and, and, and obviously, it, you know, being face-to-face uh, -face is, is obviously the best possible, but doing them remotely um, actually in many, in many of our projects has helped us um, slow down enough for, 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 the, for the people that we're working with to, to catch up on, the, on different things and to wait for processes that usually take a long time. So while process is really slow, it's uh, usually uh, gradually, um, you know, it, it's, it's actually moving forward as opposed to, to, to having a mission there and not being, uh, and, and having to do the review, okay, after the mission, did this get done or not? When you do it remotely, you have a lot more time to, um, to wait for the for the for the client to 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 be ready to take the next the, the next step, so we think that that's really really effective. Now on the actual implementation, it's after it has um, been prepared and we know what we want to do. We have worked with regional institutions um, like RCMRD in the um, in the Horn of Africa. We have worked with different um, geographical institutes or or just um, disaster. Uh, disaster risk management agencies. We have worked with international organizations uh, similar to the World Bank, like uh, bodies in the UN, um, Australian Aid. We have worked with universities in the in the client country, program country office, local disaster management agencies, private companies, networks of volunteers like OSM, uh, and we even have worked ourselves. Now. Um, I do not know if I have time to go into detail on each of the each of those. I, I, I know that, that it's most likely not. Uh, but I wanna touch a few uh, I mean talk a little bit about a few of them. So I'm gonna start with the last one because that's the most controversial uh, one. A lot of the times when we are faced with a with a project and we're given resources to implement it, um, we need to show results for that one be before, you know, especially at the beginning, before being able to move on. So in many occasions, we said, okay, this needs to be done, but really uh, we haven't um, been able to build the capacity to, to make this, but we think that it's a chicken-egg problem. Perhaps if we come with a chicken, uh, that's gonna help kickstart things that has usually backfired every time um, because uh, you don't get the engagement that you need uh, from the from from the local government and the, from, from the local disaster management agencies if you if they see that it, that's something that someone else uh, did and, and 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 that may or may not really um, you know fit their needs. So 
So I would advocate really if, if your project, uh, if you have the chance to really uh, wait and, and let the let the process be driven by the by the person that you're trying to help, by the country that you're trying to help. That's definitely more advisable than than showing results fast. And this is something that obviously uh, you know has to be communicated to to upper management. But if, if you get pressure from from above to rush things, uh, my recommendation is to really um, really decide if you're doing capacity building. Do not rush anything at all. Um, I, I guess the list is going to be there. Uh, for all different options to to go ahead, and that's useful to um, to look at. Another I important thing that we do is actually build open source tools. Um, we have hired um, people in our team who are able to contribute to the different uh, open source projects as submitters. Um, I myself am um, I'm, I'm one of those. We have also uh, tried hiring different companies to work on on a specific bit. But usually, it's really hard to get that accepted back into the open source project um, because those companies do not have the time to follow up and make sure the contributions get to the core after the contract is done. So my advice there would be to actually, uh, when you need features and new things for different open source projects, uh, try to do it with companies that are already contributing to them. Uh, and the other option, of course, is that we have hired international and local uh, consultants to, to, to do software development, and that has worked really well so far. So I think that's it. Um, if you have any questions, um, I want to know. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Ariel. Um, to facilitate a better discussion, we just ask that you type since you've all been muted, you type in the uh, group chat window on the left side any questions that you have, and I'll be happy to verbalize them uh, for the rest of us. So we'll just wait a few moments and collect a few questions. Um, Dugan Park asks, what is the best way to verify the raw data? Well, usually we have, um, I mean, the raw data that we have for, for example, for risk analysis uh, has already been, been, been used to, to do the analysis. So the person who was doing the analysis in the first time was the one in charge of curating the data that was gonna that was gonna go in. Um, so the answer to that lies in the in the process. So we should, like I said, we try to tie ourselves to either risk analysis or climate change adaptation projects. Uh, and the methodology for gathering the data in each of those is um, is different, but it's sort of tangential um, to the action of of, of of storing them and uh, and then sharing it. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Go ahead and type in the window if you do. I have a question in the meantime. Um, you were speaking about the linkages that your office was making to the disaster managers and country, the various agencies, uh, sharing with them the risk maps and risk assessments, etc. I was wondering if you worked with other agencies within the UN, like UN Spider and UNUSA, that they have technical advisory missions, and it just seems like there would be a lot of interesting synergies where they're also working with the disaster managers in the country. Um, just wondered to what extent, if all there was any collaboration. Well, uh, I will, uh, we have to forward some of those questions to other people in my team uh, that may be more familiar. We know that, that we have. Um, we have had approaches with UN OCHA and UN. Um, ISDR as well as UNO, UNOSAT, UNOSAT. Um, mm -hmm. so, so definitely we're in touch with other um, UN organizations, but it uh, definitely varies uh, from country to country. In Colombia, we're collaborating closely with UNOCHA um, and, and in Indonesia with UNDP. 
um, but it's uh, yeah, it's on a country by country uh, level, and we'll wait. We're waiting for the we're waiting for the important com um, conversations to happen later. I mean, once we have um, a lot of successes in collaboration in at the, at the country level, we can talk to the agencies for a more global approach. Okay, great. Well, um, folks, there's a one-minute survey on the bottom of the screen uh, under web links there. It just takes a second, and we'd love to hear your feedback for how this webinar went. really like to thank Ariel and the World Bank's GFDRR team, as well as our partners at Oculus Geotime, for the webinar series. Thank you all for tuning in, and looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.